right, to, to get us started today, um, just a quick overview. We'll talk some, some very basic NFP overview, uh, the basic revisions, LOMARs, CLOMARs, PMRs, standards regulation enforcement, uh, how to obtain flood hazard data, submitting MT2s, and then the FEMA review process um, and common mistakes lessons learned. Uh, I will say that, you know, I, I do appreciate any questions if I'm going too fast. Typically, this is a much longer presentation and we've condensed it down a little bit. Uh, so I can't touch on everything, obviously, but if you feel like uh, I have sped over anything or like more information, uh, we're always happy to answer questions as we go. And if we're not able to get to everything, if we have any time left over, uh, we can work on some Q&A at the end or potentially uh, you know, answer questions informally afterwards uh, or by email. Uh, I will also mention to everybody that we do have, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, CECs that we're making available for this. And towards the end of the presentation, when we're wrapping things up and doing any Q&A at the end, uh, we will ask that you drop your information into the chat box so that we can tally up people uh, who would like CEC credits uh, for this presentation. So getting started, uh, NFIP overview, how does it work? Um, the NFIP is a mutual agreement between FEMA and the communities uh, where federally backed flood insurance is available in return for communities regulating floodplain development. Uh, that comes with the mandatory purchase requirement for federally backed mortgages in mapped floodplains. So further into the regulation, uh, Permits are required for any floodplain development activity. Failure to enforce the NFIP regulations uh, can lead to some negative outcomes, uh, such as suspension from the NFIP, um, flood insurance not being made available, loss of federal grants and eligibility. So the main components of an NFIP study. Some of the basics here, as we'll touch on, our flood insurance study report uh, that just has written narratives, tables, figures uh, related to the flood hazard data in the community. And then the flood insurance maps. Uh, our flood insurance rate map is the current map that most communities use, uh, but some of the older studies you know, may still exist with uh, FHBMs, flood hazard boundary maps, and FBFMs, flood boundary and floodway maps. So in the FIRS report, as I mentioned, uh, there's a community narrative, gives you some of the background information from hydrologic and hydraulic analyses, uh, floodplain management applications, what are the flooding risks in a community? Uh, it also has tables, uh, such as the floodway data table, summary of discharges table, table, and vertical datum conversions table, just to name a few, uh, that give you some of the information that went into the study or any updates to the study. Uh, it also contains the flood profiles that show you the base flood elevation or other flooding elevations, uh, different studied recurrence intervals for your flooding sources. The flood insurance rate map, uh, the firm panel, identifies your hazard areas and locations of risks. Um, communities and agencies use them to regulate new flood prone construction. Uh, but it's important to remember that the 1% annual chance flood is only a regulatory standard. Uh, just because you are not in the 1% floodplain does not mean that you are safe from flooding or flooding cannot occur. Uh, that is just the, the bar that was set more or less uh, to determine this is the regulatory item that we are looking at. So some of the components of the firm panel, uh, just to go quickly through these for anybody that's not familiar, uh, there's the legend that shows you the information uh, about the community, what panel number you were working on, uh, things of that nature, uh, the map scale datum that, that are used. And then you have your floodplain delineations. Those include your base flood elevations, which are on the older type maps uh, and some 2D studies and things of that nature. Uh, you have the rounded up squiggly BFEs, as we would refer to them, uh, that have whole foot values. You have our, your floodplain delineation, your regu regulatory floodway, which is the hatch delineation, and then your cross sections. Some of the basic limitations of the data that is presented on the flood insurance rate maps 
Um, it's good to know the different scales that are available. And the main reason that I point this out is to let everybody in on our QA, QC steps and review items that we look at. Uh, the accepted tolerance typically for a mapping uh, comparison to the model outputs is considered to be 5% of map scale. Uh, for anybody, I don't mean to make people squint or lean in, but for anybody that can see the little red uh, dot on the scale on the figure there, that is approximately 5% of map scale. And that is what's deemed as, uh, as visible at map scale on a paper map. And so that is where we get our 5% rule uh, that we generally stick by. Uh, base flood elevations for other limitations on the maps. Uh, as I mentioned, older maps or some 2D areas that have to approximate the BFEs uh, round to the whole foot. And those are the more squiggly type uh, base flood elevations that you see. And on all newer maps, we are rounded to a 10th of a foot uh, for any cross section value or on the floodway data table. So jumping into the basic types of revisions here, uh, there are two branches on the letter of map change tree, uh, the MT1s or amendments, which is not what we are focusing on today, and then the MT2 revisions. Uh, so that is LOMARs, CLOMARs, and PMRs, uh, which I will, of course, define more for you as we go here. So generally speaking, these revisions can be variable size. They're not specific to a parcel or a lot. Uh, they include a full engineering analysis, which can include um, hydrology uh, and almost always includes hydraulic changes, uh, changes to base flood elevation and mapping updates. So to start us off with our letters of map revision, letters of map revision, excuse me, letters of map revision or LOMARs are used to revise the effective firm in FIS to show a change to the actual flood hazard data. Uh, it's built on an as-built or existing conditions, uh, does not consider any future projects or any proposed changes, any proposed projects. Um, it results in an updated firm panel and FIS attachment, uh, but it does not actually republish the full firm panel um, or the FIS itself. They are just annotated attachments of the pertinent information that's changed by the LOMAR. So when is a LOMAR required? First and foremost, when requested by the community. Uh, it's recommended for any community officials on here uh, that you have that built into local floodplain ordinance that the community reserves the right. Uh, but generally speaking, just because it is not triggered by the NFIP minimum standards does not mean that a LOMAR cannot be completed uh, or requested by the community. Physical changes resulting in BFE changes. Uh, I'm not going to make everybody squint or lean in here, and I'm certainly not going to read this word for word for anybody. Uh, I will do my best not to bore you, but um, I want to make it known that a lot of the links in this presentation are live, and a lot of this information will be shared uh, with the group upon request. So I will skim by some of this information, but it's also here as a tool for you to use um, for your own floodplain management purposes or reference. So uh, just be aware that a lot of these links are live, and when this is shared, you can use this as a tool uh, also going forward. So on to the, the physical changes resulting in BFE changes. Those are related to the Code of Federal Regulations 44, Section 65.3, uh, the right requirement to submit new technical data to FEMA, or whenever a floodway is changing. Uh, CFR 4465.7 relates to floodway revisions and when it's necessary to update those. It's also important to note, uh, since we are speaking to Colorado here, um, of course, anybody could be working on LOMARs or CLOMARs outside of the state. Um, but in Colorado, it's important to know that 0.3 feet is defined as a significant change, increase or decrease, and the state expects a LOMAR to be submitted whenever there is a change of that nature. So what can you request a LOMAR for? Um, any better data or more detailed analysis, such as revised hydrology, new hydraulic modeling, uh, better topographic data, or just simply replacing approximate studies uh, with a detailed study. 
or it can also be physical changes such as a project, a bridge or a culvert, um, you know, grading, fill, or natural changes, erosions that, are, that have happened over time in a channel, um, simply to, to update the condition and make sure we have the correct data on the maps and in the FIS attachments. Uh, it can also be submitted to correct errors in the effective data. Um, as much as we might hate to admit it, uh, none of us are perfect <laughs> and things do happen. So if you ever do identify an error, uh, you know, we're always happy to fix those. And then your final products with your LOMAR. Uh, what will you receive in return? Uh, as I talked about some of the attachments and same things that you will get uh, to start off here, uh, the community will receive a cover letter addressed to the community CEO, uh, just saying that the FIS or firm panels have been revised by a LOMAR and to use the data for future uh, floodplain management purposes. Uh, there's also a determination document. Again, I don't expect everybody to be squinting, um, but just gives you some of the basic information, the community, what regulatory data has changed, what FIS or firm attachments have been revised by this LOMAR, uh, and then gives some of the follow-up information um, and standards expected to be enforced with the LOMAR change. Your annotated FIS attachments, so your floodway data table, here's an example on the left, uh, will have just a revision limits box that goes around the data that was revised by the LOMAR. Uh, same with your profile on the right, where we will have a box. Uh, I'm not sure how <laughs> easy it is to see right now from this scale, uh, but it defines the limits of what is being changed by the LOMAR. And then of course, your firm panel revision, the mapping revision, um, same general thought, the revision limits will be pointed out to show exactly what has been changed. So I will uh, hand it over to James to pop up our first participation question here. Um, these are all uh, true false. Uh, you're not being graded, but <laughs> please uh, do your best to, to take a look and, and provide an answer as available. And let's see, James, I don't know that I can see um, if that is coming up here from my view. So if you can just confirm for me. <laughs> All right, so we will just give it a, a quick second here, but um, I, I believe there should be a Q&A box that anybody can, can put their answers in. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time sitting here since uh, we're mostly just making sure everybody's still paying attention. So um, if you're having any trouble, don't, don't worry about it. Um, and we will just keep moving here. But to our first question, true or false, uh, a LOMAR should be submitted for a proposed project. And our answer to that uh, is false. A LOMAR is submitted only for existing or as-built conditions. Uh, proposed projects are not uh, the condition that is reviewed as a part of a LOMAR submittal. And then on to our CLOMARs or conditional letters of map revision. Um, we'll have some more polling questions here in the future for anybody who missed that one. Uh, don't feel too left out. You'll, you'll have another opportunity. <laughs> okay, so CLOMARS. This is where you will submit uh, for a, an actual proposed project that you intend to do within the floodplain or that may impact the, the BFEs. Um, these are submitted so that FEMA can provide comment on the proposed changes in analysis. Um, it should be completed prior to any floodplain permit issuance uh, when a CLOMAR is mandatory, and I'll talk over that um, here soon. And it's important to note, a CLOMAR does not constitute a permit. Uh, a CLOMAR is just comment from FEMA saying if built is proposed, that this project could achieve a LOMAR in the future. It does not make it necessary that the project will be completed. Uh, it just means that it would not be in violation if built as proposed. Uh, it is still up to the community to permit all floodplain activity, and the CLOMAR activity does not, um, does not bypass that requirement by any means. Uh, it's also important to note that a conditional case does not officially revise any flood hazard data. Um, again, that would be a LOMAR, and we cannot change the actual data without the physical condition being in place. So when is a CLOMAR required? This might sound familiar, but when requested by the community, 
Again, uh, just because it is not the minimum NFIP standard saying that a Clomar must be done does not mean that the community cannot request one if they're not comfortable or would like to have FEMA's comment on a project before it is actually completed. Or whenever a proposed project encroaches upon a regulatory floodway, <clears throat> excuse me, and causes any rise in base flood elevation. Or if it encroaches within the floodplain and causes BMP increases over one foot is NFIP minimum standard. Uh, but it's also worth noting that Colorado has the higher standards and a half foot is the trigger for base flood elevation uh, rises. It's also worth noting uh, that when we talk about rises, we are talking about the pre-project condition compared to the proposed condition. Um, it's understood that there could be natural changes or things that occur in a floodplain um, that might mean comparing to the effective model is not appropriate. Um, ultimately, what we're looking for is a comparison to what is there on the ground, not counting man-made changes, um, which could be potential violations, and comparing that to the proposed condition. And I apologize, I might have <laughs> stumbled on my words there just a little bit with our existing conditions. Um, ultimately, what we need to do is isolate if there were any man-made changes um, since the date of the effective when we are considering the rises. We are comparing the existing condition to the proposed condition, but there may be other conditions or comparisons that are made along the way as well. So why, why submit a Clomar? Um, first, to stay in good standing with the NFIP. Uh, doing projects that may constitute violations could get the community in some hot water. Uh, it could also lead to further actions, such as mitigation of the project or taking the project out entirely. Um, and it can also have negative impacts to a community CRS rating. So it's important to make sure that when a clomer is required, that that is being done as a part of your floodplain ordinance and that is enforced. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, the no rise analysis and permitting is the community's tool, uh, but a deficient no rise could also lead to violations. So again, when I talk about the community can request a clomer uh, for FEMA's comment, that is their right. Even if they are demonstrating a no rise, they could still ask to have a Clomar completed to ensure that there are no violations or uh, insufficiencies. So on to some Clomar specific requirements. That CFR 44, section 6512, uh, whenever a community proposes to permit encroachments um, that will cause base flood elevations of one foot if it's not in a floodway or any rise in a floodway, um, then a Clomar is required by CFR 44, section 6512. Um, again, I'll reiterate that Colorado uses the half foot rise as the trigger. Um, so that is important to keep in mind when you are working in Colorado. Uh, it's important again, um, to reiterate that the Clomar is required before a floodplain permit is issued. Um, and as the other, considerations of 6512, you will need to certify that no structures are negatively impacted. Um, project alternatives that would not create a rise beyond the minimum requirements, the one foot or zero rise, one foot in a floodplain, zero rise in a floodway, and individual property owner notifications are required. Uh, it also requires that a follow-up LOMAR be completed after the project is done. Some other Clomar specific requirements, uh, the Endangered Species Act, ESA compliance uh, for threatened endangered species. Uh, currently only Clomars and Clomar F, which the Clomar F falls onto the MT1 side of the, uh, the LOMAC tree, um, requires that FEMA document that ESA has met for all of these conditional cases. Uh, it's important to note that ESA compliance um, is expected with every revision, regardless of if FEMA requires it as a part of their documentation or not. Um, so if you are doing a LOMAR, please also be mindful that if there are threatened or endangered species, you should consider them. At this point, it is just not something that FEMA requires as a part of your submittal and documentation uh, with a LOMAR. 
there could be changes in the future uh, or new initiatives. So please stay tuned uh, and check with your community for updates. The two main branches of ESA compliance, uh, section seven is related to whenever there is, there is federal action. Um, so if there's a federal action, action agency, uh, which means there is federal permitting or funding for the project, um, then we would be looking at um, section seven of the ESA. In that aspect, a no effect uh, determination from the federal actions agency or a not likely to adversely affect determination from the services, uh, which means the, the Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife or the US Department of Commerce's National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, other acceptable methods for showing ESA compliance, uh, biological opinion with no jeopardy determination. And as far as the Clomar requirements, a copy of the federally issued permit uh, can act as your documentation that ESA has been met. Um, as a part of the section seven, before issuing any federal permit, um, the ESA will need to be considered and therefore the copy of the permit is documentation that it went through the correct processes. ESA section nine, uh, that is for non-federal projects. And this prohibit, prohibits anyone from taking or harming endangered wildlife or uh, causing what is deemed a take, which means to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, collect, uh, maybe look at them funny if it's really causing any harm. Uh, that, that is considered a take minus the looking at funny and that is something that needs to be considered when you are doing a project. Uh, so that is demonstrated by providing a certified or assigned no take statement, uh, saying that there's no potential for any of those take actions to occur. Uh, if, if that is not possible, an incidental take permit uh, may be submitted showing that the project is the subject and covered by the permit. And then going through, how do you determine what threatened and endangered species uh, are a concern within your project area? Um, ESA, excuse me, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Services EPAC report, IPAC report uh, is an important tool and a useful tool in determining uh, the species in your area. Uh, there is a live link here. I won't, for the sake of time, I won't uh, run through a presentation or, or show that site, but it is pretty, pretty intuitive. Um, you will go in, you will define your location, draw your project site, uh, click run and confirm, and it will spit you out a report of all the threatened and endangered species in your area. Uh, a quick flow chart here. And again, I apologize uh, for causing anybody <laughs> to squint, um, but this can be used as a tool for your reference in the future, uh, just determining how you will show and demonstrate ESA compliance. You know, starting off, are there any threatened or endangered species in your area? If not, uh, you're good. There's no action required. You'll just need to demonstrate that there are none um, by providing that IPAC report, you know, update of that nature documentation. Uh, if there are threatened or endangered species, you will have to look at, you know, is there a federal action agency involved? Is there federal permitting or funding? If not, you will go down that non-federal branch there where you have to submit a no take uh, or an incidental take permit. And if there is, uh, you will go down the, uh, the no effect, no likely to adversely affect branch. Uh, it's important to note that a Clomar does not constitute federal involvement uh, or permitting. So just because you have submitted for a Clomar does not mean you are automatically going down the federal branch of this tree here. Um, this is a standalone process as the Clomar, and ultimately we are looking at permitting or funding on a federal level. So you've met your Clomar requirements. Uh, what happens next? What do you get in return? A very similar cover letter to what you would receive with a Lomar, uh, but just saying that this Clomar has been reviewed. A determination document. Uh, again, very similar to the LOMAR, except the data is not actually changing on a regulatory level. Uh, it will give you an outline of what products would be updated, what firm panels are affected, 
uh, what the final regulatory change would be if the project is built as proposed. And it gives you some of the outline of what the project included. Uh, what are the components of the project within the floodplain? Uh, it also does base flood elevation comparisons. Uh, on the second page, you can see a little gridded table there, if nothing else. Uh, it tells you what are the maximum impacts? What are the maximum rises in base flood elevations or decreases in base flood elevations? Uh, there are also some, some additional pages that tell you what would be required as a part of your follow up LOMAR and gives you some regional contacts and FEMA contacts. Um, as well. Again, uh, to reiterate, a Clomart does not constitute a permit. <laughs> so just because you have received this in the mail does not mean that you can go and build your project uh, without consulting with the community. Uh, the community must still permit everything in the floodplain per their floodplain ordinances, and the Clomart does not bypass that requirement. So our last type of revisions, um, PMRs. Typically, large revisions over four full firm panels are monitored as potential, potential physical map revisions, or PMRs. Uh, in this situation, FEMA would, would provide comment on the H&H &H analysis and mapping. Um, it would revise and republish the firm and FIS report, uh, resolve protests and appeals, and revalidate LOMAs and LOMAR Fs. Uh, but this is generally more of a study process. This is kind of beyond the typical LOMAR um, scope. A 316 PMR, which is actually a separate vehicle, is where a large revision is reviewed under the MT2 or LOMAR uh, scope, but it only provides comments on the H&H &H and mapping, but it does not actually republish the firm or the FIS report. Uh, if you are getting into a large revision of this type, it's expected or strongly recommended uh, that you coordinate with not only the community, but also the FEMA regional office, uh, because these larger revisions and enacting the floodplain changes uh, often depends heavily on funding between the community and FEMA and the region uh, to determine how to move forward with those. So uh, it will take some extra coordination to make sure those go smoothly. Our next section here, uh, what are our basic standards, regulation, and enforcement that go into a typical MT2 revision? The major sections of CFR 44 uh, that pertain to MT2 work um, include, but are not limited to, section 60, uh, criteria for land use management, 65, identification of mapping and special flood hazard areas, uh, and 72 is more related to um, the fee procedure and processing. And again, there are live links in here. So this is a link to the, the CFR 44 for your reference uh, in future. Some of the main responsibilities of the community, um, meeting CFR 44, section 60.3, uh, requiring the permits for floodplain development. Um, certifying that areas removed by fill are reasonably safe from flooding, and ensuring that all applicable, applicable federal, state, and local perm permits have been received. Henry, I'm so sorry. We have a question in the chat box or in the Q&A that I would like for you to perhaps um, answer aloud, if that's okay. Okay, yes. Pulling it up here now. I Thank see. You. I guess I will. I will read the question for everybody's sake here as well. Um, hi, I am confused on when ESA is required for a Clomar or Clomar F. I assume is is the blank there. The slide says R plus F required documentation to confirm ESA is met, and all Lomax are required to adhere. Can you clarify when Section Seven applies? I had thought that ESA is triggered for all of these because of the federal nexus. Okay, so let's go back here just to help. So any conditional case, a Clomar being the MT2 uh, or a Clomar F is the MT1. That is just a Clomar based on fill. Um, so the conditional case, because it has not been built and it is proposed, 
is part of where FEMA has to document that ESA has been met. And that is something that goes into the case file um, for any conditional case. So FEMA being the, being the action agency of a CLOMAR review does not apply to the ESA portion of that. Um, when, it, when it comes to ESA, we are looking at, is there a federal permitting, uh, such as a 404 permit from the Corps, uh, things of that nature. Again, uh, a CLOMAR is not a permit. Uh, it also means, was there any uh, funding, any federal funding that went into that? Again, um, unless there was F FEMA involvement in funding the project, FEMA would not be considered a federal action agency in that case. Uh, if, if FEMA did fund the project, then there would be some federal involvement there and that would fall down this section seven side. However, if this is just a private project uh, or a community project that does not have any other federal involvement, then we would be down the section nine side of the ESA, um, which applies to private projects, not, you know, not including federal involvement. And let's see, it looks like I lost the, oh, here it is, sorry. It fell down the, down the board here. Um, I guess, let me know if that helps to answer or <laughs> if there were any follow-ups or clarification uh, that I can help with quickly. All right, um, on to additional responsibilities of the community um, by our basic standards regulation and enforcement. Um, 60.3, as we talked about on the previous slide, uh, also applies uh, in ways such as ensuring that the lowest floor uh, meets local freeboard requirements for any new structure, um, prohibits rises over a foot in the AE, or the disclaimer of half a foot in Colorado, uh, or any rise in a floodway. And it also means that the community must ensure that the maintenance of any altered or relocated water course um, is, is completed. That includes structures such as culverts and, and things of that nature. So common parts of section 65, again, more for reference, um, requirements to submit new technical data, uh, revisions to base flood elevations, floodway revisions, uh, mapping of areas protected by levee six systems. So that's an important one to point out, uh, the 6510 uh, for levee systems. And again, that 6512 for proposed revisions that cause base flood elevation increases, uh, like we talked about in our CLOMAR section. State and local regulations. Uh, it's also good and important to be aware of your localities where you're working and what the floodplain ordinances are. Uh, FEMA defines the NFIP minimum standards. However, any community can have higher standards built into their ordinances uh, that are expected to be enforced. So it is important to check with your community, check with your state to ensure that any um, additional ordinance above the minimum NFIP standard um, is adhered to. So in Colorado, uh, for example, that means any new floodway any newly established floodway is limited to a half foot surcharge limit for, um, for your encroachments. Uh, floodways mapped on the one foot surcharge limit uh, will remain under that one foot surcharge limit. So that's important to note, what kind of floodway are you working with? Or are you establishing a new floodway? And then you are automatically in the half foot limit. Um, again, as we mentioned earlier, the point three being a significant change so that a, an increase or a decrease would mean that you should require a LOMAR uh, in the state of Colorado. Some of the basic hierarchy here as well for the standards. Um, I will point out, and I believe, yes, I do have the link here. Uh, that as we work down, there is the set of floodplain mapping standards that FEMA publishes and updates. And the main standards as we go down are from program standards, which are really the pinnacle standards that are adhered to. Um, they are all, those are mandatory. And the only exception can be granted by FEMA headquarters for a program standard. Um, and in this little table here, again, I'm not sure what the visibility is, but there is a column um, for standard type for anybody <laughs> to reference. Uh, and again, you can view this in the link uh, directly uh, when you have this handout. After program standards, 
There are working standards. Again, those are mandatory, uh, but there is regional input on providing exceptions to those as well. And then additional guidance. Um, oh, I'm sorry for suggested methods and techniques. Uh, so actually this is a link to FEMA's guidance and standards. And that is, and then best practices is really what rounds us out and lessons learned. So any methods in addition to the official guidance uh, that meets or exceeds the standards. Let's see, because I do have the questions open here. I do see that another one came in. Um, to clarify in Colorado, a proposed half foot change requires a CLOMAR and a final 0.3 foot change requires a LOMAR. So in the state of Colorado, they have deemed 0.3 foot as a significant change. Uh, and so the expectations on a state level is that a LOMAR would be required uh, to update the floodplain. And um, you know that, that can be <laughs> good or bad. It could be to the benefit if there is a decrease, um, that the mapping should be updated, uh, or it could be, mean that the um, flooding risk is greater, and that you know we need to make everybody people aware of that and put that on the products. Um, and then yes, it is a state uh, expectation that a half a foot is what triggers the sixty-five twelve requirement, and so that is um, what is enforced by the state and expected by the state for when a clomar is required in Colorado. Okay, uh, let's see, moving on here, hopefully that helped to answer that, but I'm happy to follow up later uh, if we have time for Q&A or uh, you know, if we can always do some, some informal discussions later after the presentation if necessary. Henry, real quick, there's one follow-up there. Is the 0 0.3 change a, a positive or negative or like oh, plus or minus? Yes, so that can be either a plus or minus, um, either way. So if there is a benefit to the community, um, that is something that, we would like to have reflected on the maps, or if there is a greater risk to the community, that is also something that should be reflected. So uh, that can be an either or. Okay, moving on. How do we obtain the flood hazard data uh, published by FEMA and backing the flood hazard information uh, that's regulatory for a community? Uh, first off, FEMA's Map Service Center, which is an open and publicly available website, um, which the link is provided here, that houses the effective preliminar preliminary and historic uh, firm panels, FIS reports, and LOMARs uh, or LOMAs. It does not include conditional cases, so CLOMARs or CLOMAR Fs, because those did not officially change the regulatory data. Um, it also includes the National Flood Hazard Layer, the NFHL, uh, that you can download for any digital com community uh, and has an interactive web map viewer that also houses the NFHL layer uh, in an interactive way uh, so that you can explore the area uh, in a digital uh, manner. Uh, it's important to note that it does not include any of the actual engineering analysis and data that went into developing these products. Uh, it simply gives you a place for all of the final products in one place of what is regulatory. Uh, to actually request the engineering data that went into these products, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the FEMA engineering library uh, is the means by which you can request the backup data for an MT2 or for a study. Uh, it typically takes two to three weeks to fulfill the request and it's an initial cost of $300 plus an additional $40, $40 per hour beyond four hours of basic research to find the data. Um, it's also important to note that community requests are free. Uh, FEMA will not charge the community to request their own data backing their own regulatory information. Uh, some additional resources here, uh, just for everybody's sake. Um, so FEMA Mapping and Insurance Exchange, or FMIX, uh, is where you can put in a request if you are not able to locate or identify the information that is needed. Uh, that is where your questions will be um, <clears throat> directed to the correct contacts, and somebody will reach out to you or do their best to answer your floodplain questions. 
uh, or insurance questions. Uh, the Mapping Information Platform, or MIP, uh, there are some public reports that can be run there um, by any member of the public. Uh, the Flood Risk Study Engineering Library, or, or Frizzle, uh, as it's been deemed, uh, this <clears throat> does house some study data, and some data is actually available for download. Uh, so this does have a component of the engineering library in it. Um, and so that is somewhere that you can check as a first resource without having to make an official engineering library request. Uh, FEMA's Geo Platform, the NFHL viewer, and uh, and one tool that I actually like, it's it's very helpful for those of uh, those of you using Google Earth. Uh, there's actually a download and an addition that you can put into Google Earth for an NFHL viewer as well uh, that provides a layer. So the links are all attached here for your reference. Okay, so we will jump to our next participation question. And I will try to have this <laughs> open to see if things are, are coming in as well. Oh, there we go. I do see it now. So our first question, true or false? If a CLOMER is approved, a floodplain development permit is still required. Okay, for the sake of time here, we'll just, we'll jump through these. Uh, so the answer there is, is true. Again, a CLOMAR does not constitute a permit. Um, so any approved CLOMAR still has to go through the local floodplain management uh, and permitting processes. Our next question here, true or false, proposed work in the floodway fringe requires an approved CLOMAR. So that is the area between the flood bank and the limit of the floodway, so outside of the floodway. Okay, and to answer that, um, that is a trick question actually. So <laughs> everybody got it right or wrong, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> um, so a CLOMAR not required by the NFIP minimum standards could still be required if the community requests it. Uh, so just because you don't meet the minimum standards um, for, for requirement of a CLOMAR does not mean that the community uh, may not enforce that. Okay, and on to our submittal data and how to submit an MT2 request. So basic LOMAR and CLOMAR requirements um, include completed and signed MT2 forms. Uh, that includes a signature from a registered engineer in the state uh, from the impacted communities. And uh, oftentimes, depending on the format that you use, a signature also from the requester in the case. Um, the review fee must be submitted. A project narrative of what's being changed, what the expectation is for the LOMAR or CLOMAR, um, and then any backup data and executable models for any H&H &H analysis completed. Uh, it also includes the topographic work map, an annotated firm where you overlay your revised changes onto the effective firm panel, uh, property owner notifications for anybody adversely impacted by changes, uh, or by floodway changes at all. And then those CLOMAR specific requirements uh, that we've already talked about, the 6512 and ESA. Uh, it's important to point out some of the resources that are available to any requesters or people looking at submitting MT2s. Um, as of this past year, FEMA has published the first official MT2 requirements guidance document. Uh, so that is the link on the left here, and that's something that I would like to point out specifically for everybody because it is a new tool. Uh, it, it has additional clarification and guidance specific to submitting MT2s and what types of things are required. Um, in addition, there is also the MT2 instructions manual, uh, a little screenshot on the right of uh, one example pulled from there, <coughs> uh, is one of the submittal checklist uh, items that is included inside the application um, and instructions manual. This is an important tool just to know that you are checking all of those boxes because as we talk through the process more, you'll see um, failure to include major components can, can cause major delays to your submittal. Um, and of course, everything that we receive, uh, nobody says you can just get this done whenever. It's always, uh, you know, I'd like this done yesterday. So uh, of course I will do my best to teach you how to 
save some time uh, if possible or make things go more smoothly because I know everybody's interest in, in the time and money factor um, is of course very important. So some of the basics, uh, your MT2 form one, which is your overview and concurrence form. Uh, this is where you'll give some basic information about the revision, uh, what regulatory products such as the firm panel uh, does it affect. This is also that signature page that I mentioned where you'll have the community's concurrence and signature as well as a registered professional engineer. Uh, and you'll give some basic background and information about what you're revising. Uh, does it include a, you know, hydraulic analysis, hydrologic analysis, uh, floodway revision, things of that nature. Uh, you will also, there's also a section on here. I'm not sure if you can see at this, uh, at this scale, but there's a section for the review fees where you will just document um, if you are paying a fee and just what amount you had enclosed as a part of that. Uh, or if you are not including a fee, there's a box there that, that points out, um, attach an explanation. Uh, we will go through what types of fee exemptions there are available, uh, but it's important to note why you have not paid a fee when you've submitted a case so that we don't have to come back and ask or reset your timelines and cause delays in the project or, uh, or approval. Form two, river and hydrology and hydraulics. Again, this is where you will go into a little bit more detail of exactly what you're changing. What's your flooding source? Uh, what type, you know, are you changing the hydrology and why? Um, what methods are you using? And then to hydraulics, uh, where are your tie-ins? What are your limits of revision? Uh, what is your modeling naming convention and the datum that you're using? Uh, and then all the way down to your, your mapping requirements, you know, what type of survey and information are you using and as the basis for this. Uh, an important thing to note is that your revision must be based on data that is as good or better than the effective analysis. Um, and so that's one reason why the topographic information is provided on here, because that is something that will be looked at. Uh, additionally, on that, that third bit of the slide there, uh, you will mark yes, no to the major um, major requirements and standards, just to make sure that as we are looking through things here, um, we are accounting for the major regulatory items that you have to include. And then finally, uh, MT2 Form 3, your river and structures form. This is where you're going to outline uh, what has been changed, what new structures are included as a part of this analysis, you know, was it a physical change, channelization, a bridge culvert, a levee, a dam, uh, things of that nature where you will outline, you know, the basics of what is being revised. Uh, it's important to note there's additional eight pages for levee certification. And if you are submitting a levee for review, uh, there's actually a certification on one of those final pages of the levee section uh, that must be certified by a professional engineer. But again, this is not this is not a levy training. We could spend days on that, um, and so I'm going to keep this focused on the general process. And uh, you know, of course, there is there is additional levy support um, available as needed. Some of the other basics: uh, your review fees. What do you have to pay as you're submitting? Uh, so for our LOMARS, uh, I guess one important thing to point out to everybody before I before I dive in too deep is that you will notice there is the online versus the user fee uh, that is a difference of $250. So the difference there is if you are using the online LOMAC tool, uh, there is no paper processing or handling that goes into that and therefore the fee is actually $250 less. Uh, the user fee where that is $250 more is when you are sending it to the FEMA uh, LOMAC clearinghouse where you actually physically send the data and then they have to process it and, uh, and make it available to the review team. And so some of the major categories here, uh, LOMAR is based on bridge culvert channelization um, is in the $8,000 range, as well as in as-built follow-up to a CLOMAR. Uh, some of, you know, one of the additional notes on here, so there is a different fee if you're talking about a levy berm or an alluvial fan. Uh, so note the, subs, the superscript of there is an additional fee of $60 an hour uh, thereafter, after the original fee. That is not something that is very standard to be applied, but just know that it, it could potentially show up in a revision. So build that into your planning. Um, in most standard uh, alluvial fan or levy revisions, 
you know, that is not something that comes up as an additional fee. Um, but if it is extremely complicated or a major large revision, you know, there is potential that that could be applied. Uh, and of course, based solely on more detailed data. So that is not including man-made changes. Uh, if you just have an existing conditions update or replacing a zone A uh, with a detailed study reach, that is actually a fee exempt revision. And we will talk more about that here in the coming slides. For the Clomars, uh, many of the same items that I went over in the Lomars still applies. That superscript for levies or alluvial fans uh, that could go into an additional fee. Uh, and of course, the paper versus online uh, $250 difference in review fee. And then the PMRs are large physical map revisions uh, over four firm, firm panels. Um, again, those carry similar fees, but it's also important to note that there is an additional fee per firm panel uh, that goes into that that must be worked out. Um, again, that's something that you also want to coordinate closely with the community and the region to help work through is there funding available uh, to fund a PMR or when is it available? Um, so I will just give that that asterisk to my statement there that, uh, you know, in addition to just submitting, you will also want to make sure that you have close coordination if you know that your revision is going to be larger than four for firm panels. And of course, the important part, how do I keep my money? How do I, how do I file for a fee exemption as a part of my Lomar or Clomar submittals? Uh, so to run down the list here, um, submitting a Lomar to fix a study analysis error, that is a fee exemption. Uh, an existing conditions LOMAR to reflect natural changes in a channel uh, is fee exempt. Federally sponsored flood control projects. So we are generally talking larger scale projects such as uh, dams, levees, things of that nature, <clears throat> where 50% or more of the project cost is federally funded. Uh, detailed H&H &H conducted to replace a zone A, as I mentioned before, uh, with a detailed study where you establish the base flood elevations. And then in accordance with the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act of 2014, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, when the primary purpose of the project is habitat restoration and the project is funded in whole or in part with federal or state funds, uh, that is considered a fee exemption. So I'd like to point out the primary purpose part of this. Um, just because you have a a full update or habitat restoration project and you happen to incorporate a footbridge or some type of passage there, that does not necessarily um, deny you uh, this exemption. But the primary purpose of the project has to be habitat restoration. And so that can be, that should be submitted with the justification and with the explanation whenever you submit a case. Um, as should any of these fee exempt requests um, should have an explanation provided when you submit. Uh, it's also important to point out um, that generally speaking, improvements to floodplain uh, maps and studies that incorporate man-made modifications are generally not exempt. That does not apply obviously to the habitat restoration or the flood control project. Uh, but otherwise speaking, if we're incorporating man-made changes, uh, that is not considered just an existing conditions LOMAR um, as it's there, it's existing, I want to update the maps. There was a physical change, a man-made change that went into that, and there is a review fee that, that generally goes along with those. So jumping into the main MT2 submittal requirements. Uh, so our project narrative, and you will probably hear me mention this ad nauseum <laughs> for the remainder of uh, the presentation here, so forgive me now. Uh, but this is very important, uh, where you will describe the project area and what work was actually completed and what are the objectives of your LOMAR or CLOMAR. Um, you need to give a full explanation so that the reviewer knows what exactly are we trying to accomplish here. Uh, you also need to provide explanation of what engineering judgment or what inputs went into your model or what special accommodations are needed for the project. Um, it's more important that you include this information largely so that we don't have to ask. If you can give that to the reviewer upfront, 
uh, without needing the additional clarification, there is potential for less review comments that come back. And again, as we're talking through the timeline, you'll see um, that this does have impacts of, of potentially months uh, to the overall approval of your case. So the more that you can document, the more that you can explain in your initial submittal, the less that we have to ask for and potentially the less back and forth that there is on the revision. For H&H, &H, um, first, it's important to note that you should be using any updated model um, as something that is approved by FEMA. Unfortunately, I don't know if these links have been restored as FEMA did have a platform change, uh, but I've included them here in case they do come back online for people's reference. Uh, but FEMA does maintain a list of approved hydraulics and hydrology analyses uh, model types. And so it's important that you don't um, go off cuff and just pick something just because you are more comfortable with it. Uh, it's also important to note and make sure that you're using something that's approved by FEMA for mapping revisions. So as a part of your, your H and H model submittals, um, you should provide the executable versions. Uh, the reviewers on the other side will have to be running those and making sure that there aren't any major errors that come out. Uh, so simply providing a PDF of the outputs um, is, is not acceptable. You should submit the executable version. Uh, again, document the input variables in the report. Um, things like the, you know, if you're using any special Manning's or vertical datum conversions, uh, what soil types went into your hydrology or rainfall depths were you using, and what was the source of that data. Uh, it's important to document that so that we know where we are starting and have a good baseline on the review. Uh, you should also submit all the appropriate as-built or proposed plans uh, to verify any structure that you're modeling as a part of your analysis. Uh, we will be documenting and checking uh, that any as-built or proposed plan matches what you actually have in your model. Um, and so you should include that. And of course, vertical datum control is very important as well. Uh, so it's recommended that you include that within the description box of your model, um, if possible. For example, in HECRAS, you know, that's very easy to do. Uh, and on your as-built plans, we will want to ensure that we are working in the same datum. So we will need that documented on the plans. So our, our hydraulic modeling progression um, as we work through here. So we will start with the duplicate effective model. Uh, that's something that should be requested from FEMA, the community, uh, the state, CWCB, Mile High Flood District. Um, those are all resources where you can obtain the effective model. Uh, so you will obtain that model and you will reproduce it on your machine. Uh, the main purpose is just to ensure that you have the correct model. Um, and we start with the correct baseline. The next model progression is your corrected effective model. Uh, that's used to correct errors in the duplicate effective or update topographic data, add additional cross sections, things of that nature, uh, but it should not include man-made changes. Uh, beyond that, the next step would be going to your existing conditions or pre-project conditions model. Uh, that's where you would reflect any man-made changes that have occurred, as well as um, the additional items that you would include in your corrected effective model. Um, it's important to note, sometimes it's not always necessary to have a corrected effective model if the duplicate effective is indicative of the conditions, of the floodplain conditions at the time. Um, so I will just put the, the little asterisk there for the corrected effective model at, you know, as necessary. Um, but again, so the existing pre-project conditions model reflects the current conditions, uh, any updated data, what is on the ground before you start work. And then your revised, proposed, or post-project conditions model incorporates any physical changes that you've actually made as a part of your LOMAR or COLOMAR submittal. Um, again, going back to that narrative, it is important uh, to describe what steps were made in between. Uh, what went into updating these different model uh, iterations to get from one step to the next. Uh, that just helps to avoid any future questions that come up um, to have it documented in the first place. I will just point out uh, that there is a resource as a part of the new MT2 guidance document. Um, one example is the chart here shown on the screen of just the model progression um, and where to start. 
you know, generally speaking, we would ask that you start with the effective model if it is a digital executable model and make your revisions into that model um, so that there is a, a full comprehensive model for the reach if possible. Excuse me, there are some situations um, where that would not be appropriate. And that's definitely something that you know, we're always happy to work through as a part of the revision. But generally speaking, if you can start with the, the effective model as the basis for your revision, you know, that is what is preferred. So why do we ask for all of these models? Ultimately, all you want to do is update the floodplain, update the base flood elevations, you know, why all these steps in between? Um, and for your understanding, and so that you know why we are asking for all of this, um, as I mentioned, the duplicate effective is just to ensure that you have the, the actual effective model and you, you know, that is what you're starting with. Uh, in addition, we make comparisons of all of these different model iterations uh, to check for different regulatory items. So for example, um, when we're comparing our existing conditions versus du the duplicate effective, uh, we're trying to identify if there are any potential violations that have occurred. Um, as the existing conditions is a step where you will include the man-made changes, um, we will make that comparison to see how, are there man-made changes that have violated NFIP standards by causing rises in the floodplain uh, that were not properly permitted or accounted for. Uh, and then our existing versus uh, proposed or post-project, what are the true impacts on the ground that this project is having? Um, what is it actually doing compared to what is on the ground today because sometimes the effective model is not necessarily accurate or up to date with the physical condition of the floodplain, uh, you know, if, for example, it's a little bit older study. And then finally, our proposed or post project comparison to the effective, that is ultimately telling us what regulatory data will change as a part of the revision. Some of the other basic hydraulic requirements, um, half a foot tie-in at the upstream and downstream ends of your revision. Uh, if you're in a detailed flooding source or limited detailed study, um, you know, you're expected to achieve tie-in to the effective base flood elevations within half a foot at the upstream and downstream end. Um, section 65.6A8 says that you must study the same recurrence intervals currently studied in the effective flood insurance study report. Um, it also says that unless you can show that the effective model uh, is not appropriate or is not available, that a revision should be made in the same model type as the effective. Um, with the larger occurrence of, of 2D modeling and things coming up, um, you know, for example, relating to 2D, uh, a lot of engineers are becoming more comfortable using a 2D analysis or it is uh, cost effective when they have, you know, LIDAR available or, or things of that nature. But it's important to note that just because you have a 2D analysis available does not necessarily mean that FEMA will approve to revise a 1D model with a 2D analysis. Um, there is special monitoring and, and situations, you know, that will go into that to achieve approval. But generally speaking, the CFR does state that you should use the same model type as the effective, um, unless there are justifications. So that's an important thing to point out as, uh, as 2D modeling is becoming um, more prolific, um, that you should consider that before you just jump in and spend a, a ton of money updating and trying to make a revision that FEMA may deem uh, inappropriate. Uh, finally, um, Something that is new as a part of the MT2 guidance that came out, it is not a new review item, but it is newly published in the guidance, uh, is that post-project base flood elevations must match pre-project base flood elevations within 0.1 foot at the limits of revision. Uh, ultimately, the intention of that is to ensure that if you've done a project, you are capturing the project changes. Um, and so I know, I'm sure there's probably <laughs> some, some protests are, are going through your minds at this time saying, well, FEMA says there's a half foot tie-in. Uh, why are they all of a sudden throwing a 0.1 foot tie-in as well? It's important to point out that the 0.5 foot is to the effective data. The 0.1 foot is between pre-project and post-project. So that is your, more of your existing condition uh, compared to your proposed or post-project. So your hydrologic analyses, um, 
so what do you need to submit with those? Uh, as I mentioned before, all backup information and calculations. So you'll want to document how did you come up with the curve numbers? Uh, what regression equations did you use? What was your time of cal concentration calculation? And, and how did you actually come up with it? Um, the, the other supporting data that I mentioned earlier, for you know, such as soil types, land use, uh, did you use a gauge to, you know, to actually compare your results and calibrate, um, or is it based on a gauge analysis entirely? Uh, you'll also submit a certified topographic drainage area map. Uh, that's how we will ensure that any delineated basins are correct and accurate, and that will be certified um, as a part of the final case file. Uh, you will also want to ensure that any change to your hydrology is actually significant. Um, so FEMA does have additional guidance on this. I will just provide the, the general rule of thumb because we could go down the rabbit hole and, and be on this topic for a long time. Uh, but generally speaking, if you're not changing the, the flows by roughly 5%, chances are you need to consider, is this actually a significant change? Uh, if it's not considered significant, uh, FEMA will not um, actually update the maps to reflect that. Uh, it's also important to make sure that you use the appropriate level of detail, which I mentioned earlier, um, any data that you submit as a part of revision has to be as good or better than the effective data. So there are some caveats here. There are some situations where um, this general hierarchy that I have provided, this one, two, three here is, is not necessarily 100% um, to go by, but generally speaking, uh, a gauge analysis is considered your best available data. So if you have a gauge, um, it's best that you use it. Uh, a calibrated rainfall runoff model would be your next available or next best available. And then generally speaking, regression equation is considered the lowest level of detail. And then for your work maps, um, some of the important items to make sure that are on there. Uh, the work map should be certified, so signed, sealed, and dated uh, by a professional engineer. Uh, you will need to include your effective floodplain delineations and your revised floodplain delineations and show how they tie into one another at the upstream and downstream ends. Uh, you'll include all of the topography used. You know, it must be best available and as good or better than the effective. Uh, you should include your vertical datum so that we know you know, what is our vertical, excuse me, vertical datum control for the project and for the revision, uh, your mapping scale and include a north arrow. Uh, it's important to note also that for LOMARS, uh, you should submit georeferenced digital mapping files when available, uh, preferably GIS because those are the same format that the final NFHL attachments uh, will be made in, but georeference CAD files are also acceptable. Your annotated firms. Uh, so ultimately, all you're doing is taking the effective firm panel and overlaying your line work. Uh, so you will take your revision, take your new floodplain delineations, lay it on top of the effective firm, show how it ties in, and that is that requirement. Um, it's it's expected that you should include the legend from the firm panel so that we know what we're working in here in case you're using like a limited view of the firm panel and not necessarily showing your revision on the entire firm panel. And then other regulatory requirements. Uh, so property owner notifications. This is something that comes up a lot. Um, you know, who is actually responsible for sending out these notifications? So it's worth noting that the applicant for the MT2 um, submittal is responsible for the notifications, but whenever a floodway is being revised, the community must be involved. Uh, ultimately, as a part of the requirement, we're going to be looking for uh, some sort of documentation from the community saying that, that all impacted property owners have been notified of the floodway changes. Uh, alternatively, letters sent on community letterhead um, are also acceptable in that manner, but there will be community involvement if you have a floodway change. Uh, why do we submit these notifications? Um, again, for any floodway changes, uh, any increase in base flood elevation or special flood hazard area, um, or an existing to propose increase that triggers the 6512. And so I did not... Uh, I missed the mention here for the half foot for Colorado for that 6512, but just keep that in your mind as well. Um, 
So the one foot generally by the minimum standards, if you're not working in a floodway or half foot in Colorado or any rise in a floodway um, otherwise. And then what content are you including in those notifications? Um, it's worth noting, sorry, before I go on, that there is template language that is included in the MT2 instructions document. Uh, and I provided the link uh, earlier in the slide deck. And so that is a good place to start. If not, your reviewer will generally send you a template if you have not submitted one with your initial submittal. So keep that in mind. Um, and that goes into, there is the template that includes the language. Um, and so generally, you will use that to include what community uh, is being impacted, what firm panels and uh, flooding sources, are there any floodway changes? Are there BFE or SFHA increases? Uh, and you will include a contact so that any interested party can reach out uh, to view the data. Uh, some of the other important things to note, uh, notifications can take the form of individual letters or newspaper notifications. Uh, the couple stipulations that go into that, um, if there is a floodway, as I talked about, any individual letter sent must either be on community letterhead or we need a statement from the community saying all affected property owners have been notified. Uh, but in this situation, a newspaper notification would still be acceptable, so that does not rule it out. Uh, this is specifically to individual notifications. And then for a CLOMAR, anytime that that 6512 requirement is triggered, individual notifications are mandatory and must be sent. So you do not have well, the newspaper notification will not, um, will not cover that requirement. You could always send that in addition to the CLOMAR documentation, uh, the CLOMAR notifications, uh, but ultimately to fulfill that requirement, individual letters are required. Okay, and then into our general review process. Uh, so what are the different roles? Uh, first off, the technical review process. Um, Generally speaking, that is something that is uh, done by the contractor, the PTS provider, or specific to Colorado. Um, all revisions as of this year are handled by the different LOMAR delegations. Um, well, CWCB as of this year, Mile High Flood District going back quite a ways, uh, where all revisions are handled by the state and by Mile High Flood District. Um, generally speaking, I'll say from my experience more, you know, the PTS contractor, uh, Compass throughout the rest of Region 8 uh, is the contact and, and the responsible party for the technical review. Uh, technical assistance and violation resolution is something that is generally handled uh, within the FEMA regional offices. And then your final review and signature of the MT2 determination is something that is done with FEMA headquarters. Uh, just a little bit of insight into the general review process. Um, your requests will be received. There's an administrative setup uh, to set up your case number, uh, include any payment or anything into the into the file to make sure that that is uh, that box is checked. And then there's an additional data, an initial data review uh, that gets started. And as we are reviewing, we will review uh, to the extent possible of the data submitted. And if everything is submitted that is required and there are no additional comments, um, we will go you know, straight to our detailed review and then issuing the case if no data is required. Um, if the submittal is not complete, again, we will review to the furthest, th furthest extent possible, uh, but at a certain point, an additional data request will be provided to the requester uh, to ask for anything rem remaining. Um, and so this flowchart is just the, the basics of that. There is a 90 day regulatory back and forth where FEMA has 90 days to review the case. Uh, and then the requester has 90 days to reply to any comments. And that goes back and forth until um, the revision is completed. So your initial data review, uh, as I said, Earlier, there is the checklist that it's included as a part of the MT2 instructions. So this is the, the same screenshot that you saw earlier. Uh, and it's just basically a completeness check of the submittal uh, where the fees concluded, the MT2 forms, the models, maps, uh, notifications, and is, was there tie into the effective data? Uh, just kind of a high level, you know, is everything included and all the basics um, 
provided. And then when we get more to a detailed review of the data, uh, we're talking about a technical review of any submitted H&H, &H, um, compliance with the guidance and best practices, and then MAP model agreement. Um, one of the big things, and this also will show up in the lessons learned, uh, is ensuring that you have MAP, map model agreement. Um, is the revised flood plan that you submitted uh, the same as the modeling that you actually provided? And then, of course, we will check for any potential violations, anything that came up uh, that caused rises that were not permitted or should not have been permitted, um, and we will review that to the furthest extent possible. Uh, so an example of an additional data request letter, uh, this is sent out to the requester with the community CC'd. Um, this will summarize the basic technical comments that have come out of the revision. Um, a few of the important things to note on here is there is reference to the 90 day deadline saying if the comments are not addressed within 90 days, the case will be suspended and any fees will be forfeit. Uh, it's also important to note that the, the analysts uh, reviewing your case should send 30 and 60 day reminders to help emphasize the deadline. Uh, we don't want to suspend cases, obviously. Uh, sometimes things go to junk mail, things get missed in inboxes or accidentally marked as read. Uh, so we will do our best to give you the benefit and try to remind you that these deadlines are coming uh, before suspending your case. And then onto our review timeline. Um, so again, as I mentioned, FEMA is required to either issue a determination or notify of additional data that's required within 90 days, and then the requester has an additional 90 days to address those comments. Uh, and that cycle can go back and forth until all data um, is addressed and all items are, are received uh, with the submittals. And then ultimately, once all data is received, the case will be issued. And then for LOMARS, uh, this specific example here is for LOMARS, there's a approximately a four point four and a half month appeal period. Um, so to break that down, I will explain there is a, it's technically a 90 day appeal period. However, there is some additional administrative time built into the front and back of that, that ultimately um, drags it out to four and a half months overall before the LOMAR is effective. Uh, ultimately, the way that that four and a half months is determined, there will be two newspaper publications by FEMA stating that they are beginning a regulatory appeal period for a revision. And then following the second publication, the second week, um, that begins the 90 day appeal period. And then there's an additional 30 days afterwards for gathering any, any appeals or addressing any appeals that came in within the appeal period. And so that's how we get to that four and a half months. Um, so just keep in mind that just because you received a determination letter in the mail um, does not mean that this is ready for regulatory use just yet. Uh, keep a close eye that there is that um, there's an issue in state listed on there, and then there's an effective date listed on there, and that will be approximately four and a half months out from the issue date. Um, and then for just planning purposes for anybody submitting a case, um, again, I mentioned that there is that 90 day back and forth uh, that resets and can cycle until all data is received. Um, most revisions include at least one data request. Um, so plan accordingly. Like I said, nobody just wakes up one day and says, I'm just going to submit a LOMAR because I feel like it and, you know, and I don't have a, a special agenda for it or anything. Everybody wants it done yesterday. Um, we understand that, you know, we do our best to work with, with people, but also build into your planning, please, that there probably will be at least one data request. And so you will not just submit a LOMAR and it will be issued ni uh, 90 days from then. Um, it's just important to keep in mind because obviously everybody has a tight timeline and everybody wants these complete as quickly as possible. And so I actually jumped ahead of myself a little bit, so I won't, uh, I won't double down on this, but this slide here, again, that will be available for reference, um, breaks down that two weeks, the 90 day appeal period and the 30 day period afterwards for your case to go effective. Um, it's important just to note for this also that if an ordinance update is required for the community, uh, for example, if they've never had a floodway and do not include floodway ordinances in the local ordinance, 
um, an additional three months will be added for ordinance adoption. For example, um, you know, if we added a new floodway the community did not have ordinance for before. Um, and then it's important to note that every case now has an appeal period with exception only to reissuance cases. Uh, that is when a case has been through the appeal period and become effective. However, it was superseded for some reason, um, such as new maps coming out that, that were not able to incorporate it, um, but the data is still valid and should be, still be shown on the map. Uh, that is a reissuance process where the case will be issued again to the new map to be shown. And because it has already been through an appeal period, it does not require a new appeal period. Uh, otherwise, all other LOMAR revisions uh, do have an appeal period tacked on, so plan accordingly. Uh, effects on MT1s. So LOMARs do not actually go through and revalidate LOMAs, LOMARFs, CLOMAs, or CLOMARFs. Uh, so it's important to coordinate or know that if you have a large LOMAR that is going to uh, devalidate a lot of these, that is something that should be coordinated uh, to get them revalidated um, if they are still you know, necessary or valid to show on the map. Okay, and we'll jump into, I believe, our last participation section here. So our first true, true false question, um, true or false, it costs $8,000 online uh, for review fee for me to update the maps for the erosion that has occurred in my channel. So the answer here, that is false. Uh, a LOMAR submitted to reflect the natural changes in a reach is fee exempt as long as there are no man-made changes being included. Our next question, true or false? Uh, my LOMAR is ready for use the day I get it in the mail uh, or electronically. And so this is false as well, which you heard me just talk about a, a couple times over here. <laughs> uh, so all LOMARs that revise regulatory data are subject to that appeal period that we talked about. Um, again, that only exception is reissuance cases that have already been through an appeal period. Okay, so I will just talk over some of our uh, common mistakes, lessons learned. Um, I guess I will, I will mention now for anybody to think, if you know a specific example that you would like to, to share for everybody's knowledge that I don't touch on here, um, you know, this is a great, a great place to share that information, uh, make life easier for everybody. You know, we're not here to, to stand in everybody's way and, and be a roadblock. Um, we'd like to make this process as, as easy as possible and share our information. Um, so I will just ask anybody that, you know, if anything does pop up in the back of your mind as we're going through, um, you know, I'm sure everybody would benefit uh, from, from some additional great lessons learned. Obviously, I, I do not have the time to go into everything here. So um, I will just make that, that note to everybody as we go. So some of the uh, general lessons learned or mistakes with submittals, um, not filling out your MT2 forms or missing them entirely, uh, things such as, you know, your community acknowledgement. Uh, there are some exceptions to community acknowledgement that are outlined in uh, the MT2 guidance, but ultimately each community has to have the uh, ability to comment on any revision. Um, and so the concurrence and signature of the community is expected with your revision as you submit it. Um, providing annexation documents if necessary. Uh, if the area you're working on is currently shown in one community on the firm panel, but you know that it's been annexed by another community, uh, providing those documentations and an annexation map um, is important so that we don't have to come back and request clarification for that. Uh, because ultimately, as we're reviewing it, we will be looking at the firm panel and, uh, and determining are all the communities actually providing concurrence to this revision. Uh, incorrect property owner notification language. Um, I will say that one major lesson learned for everybody here uh, to save some time and potentially some money is that we recommend that you submit a draft with your initial submittal and not necessarily expect um, that you can get it all done in one shot before you submit the case. Uh, that is because as we go through, if technical comments cause changes, that might mean that uh, new people need to be notified. 
it may mean that the overall impacts that you outlined have changed by the end of the case. And so initially speaking, it's, it's recommended that you submit a draft. And then of course, those missing or incorrect fees, uh, or to go along with this, an explanation of why you did not pay a fee um, is very important to include because otherwise we could potentially send out a fee request letter, which again, resets that 90 day timeline and causes delays in your overall processing. Some other general mistakes, uh, missing a narrative or not including enough information in your narrative uh, for us to determine what the overall anticipation is for the revision. Um, not providing as-built or proposed plans or survey um, or including the vertical datum on those plans or using the wrong effective data entirely. Uh, for example, missing the fact that there is a LOMAR that is now effective on your reach and you started with the baseline of the data that was effective previous to that. Uh, wrongful identification of levy features is something that's important to point out as well. Uh, any man-made feature that's providing protection from the 1% flood must be accredited, excuse me, through the 6510 requirements. So the biggest example uh, that I can point out of wrongfully assuming a levy situation uh, is using road embankments and highways that were not intended to be used or designed for use as levies. Um, this is something that has had a much more push to it um, and FEMA has emphasized as well as a part of our review process that using man-made high ground to protect low ground is deemed a levy situation. Um, and so please keep that in mind that just because you have run, you know, run your cross section to a road or, or something of that nature and decided to end the flooding and the floodplain mapping, uh, that may not be appropriate. For our hydrology, um, as we talked about before, the links that unfortunately I don't believe are active, but that I have uh, provided reference to, you know, using models that are not currently uh, approved by FEMA. Uh, if you're not using an approved model, uh, FEMA will likely not accept your revision. Uh, there are some situations where new models could be added to that list, but it is also an extensive process. So I will say uh, that for any, any basic revision, it is best to start in the list of approved models um, and build your, build your changes from there. Um, updated hydrology with an insignificant change. Again, I gave that 5% uh, as kind of a general rule of thumb. Uh, there are also some other ways of determining the significant change, like the 68% confidence uh, limit test, or also doing kind of a sensitivity to see if the change in hydrology results in a half foot base flood elevation change or not. Um, determining that you know, your revision is significant is, is a major step if you want to actually revise the hydrology and have FEMA recognize it. Uh, the missing or insufficient drainage area maps, you know, not including the topography that you use to delineate your basins um, is a big one and not having a certification on that. Uh, we will require a certification to back up the data uh, that we are revising for the floodplain um, revision. And that is something that, you know, will need to go through the appeal period for any revised hydrology. And so the certification on that drainage area map is required. And also um, additionally, just not giving enough background information calculations or inputs that you put into your model but did not actually provide as a part of the review. Uh, if we can't determine how you came up with the variables or inputs, we will ask, and that could potentially provide delays or cause delays uh, to your overall revision or approval. So hydraulics, um, one big thing to note is your downstream boundary condition. Um, that will often be asked for as a part of best practices and, and how you incorporate those. Uh, so to quickly run through, if you are tying in to a detailed study reach that currently has a base flood elevation, generally speaking, if you are using a truncated model um, where you are only looking at your revision reach, you would want to use the known water surface elevation from the effective analysis as the boundary condition uh, for the downstream end of your reach. 
Uh, first off, that helps to achieve your half foot tie-in because you're already defining that you're within the half a foot limit. Uh, and it helps to just have a complete analysis so that you know that you're accounting for any downstream impacts or effects um, you know, of, of the downstream analysis that you did not include in your specific analysis upstream. Uh, generally speaking, for a confluence, if we are not considering a coincident peaks assumption, uh, we would expect to see a normal depth boundary condition uh, used for any of those revisions. Um, also, if we are tying into a zone A that does not have an effective model uh, that we could determine the, I guess I will say, unofficial base flood elevation from, uh, we would expect to use a normal depth. And I will give that some clarification um, just because in the past, some zone A models have not been, or some zone A uh, mapping projects have not been model backed. And in many instances, or some instances they are, and going forward, all new zone A's must be model backed. Uh, so even though there is not a published base flood elevation, uh, if the model is available, it's important that we use the boundary condition from that model, um, a known water surface, you know, if it's available to make sure that we are considering the downstream uh, analysis that went into that. And so some additional modeling items uh, that we look at using a mixed, mixed or supercritical flow regime. Uh, it's important to note that you know, mixed flow or supercritical flow is only allowed to be uh, you know, shown when it's a concrete line channel. And so if you're talking about a natural channel, uh, all revisions should just be made in uh, subcritical flow. And there should be some justification if you are going to use, you know, mixed or supercritical flow in your model. Um, and then also just general placement uh, and modeling of hydraulic structures. You know, it's very important just to check consistency of what you submit to FEMA uh, and what you're expecting, you know, with the actual as-built plans and what you know is on the ground. Um, Comparing to your as-built plans, making sure that all of the elevations, your inverts, your top of road, uh, things like that are consistent is one major item that we will come back with and comment and say, your plans do not match your model. Uh, you know, please revise this and you know, we will not accept it until they are consistent. Um, some other things that are important to note are your cross-section placement. Uh, the most common to see is HECRAS, and you can use the HECRAS uh, user manuals to go along with that, you know, to explain how the two cross sections upstream and downstream uh, of a culvert or a bridge should generally be placed. Um, your loss coefficients, again, going with that structure, you know, there are additional losses as the floodplain uh, constricts and expands going in and out of a structure, so those should be considered. Um, ineffective flow you know, to block what active flow is, you know, upstream or downstream, if it is actually, you know, blocked out by the structure itself. Um, and I guess, again, like I already mentioned, not matching your plans that you've submitted, uh, having consistency between all data. Floodway encroachment items, as you're doing a floodway analysis. Um, there are some special caveats, I will say, you know, for example, mile high flood district. So I won't say that this that my examples here are end all be all, um, but generally speaking as a part of you know, our PTS review, uh, we would generally not accept ineffective flow in the floodway. Um, again, you know, check with your local floodplain management. <laughs> I know that Mile High Flood District and you know, potentially CWCB uh, will have some of their own uh, special requirements and review items that they go into that. Um, so I am just giving that caveat as I go through, <laughs> but generally speaking, we expect the floodway to be reserved for active flow. Um, sudden expansion contraction in the floodway. Um, again, we expect the reservation of, of active flow. So sudden expansion and contraction could mean that there is need for ineffective, ineffective flow you know, on the edges of the floodplain because it can't physically be flowing in a one-dimensional criteria. Um, Additional items, encroachments inside the bank stations. Uh, the definition of the floodway is the channel and any overbank areas necessary to pass the flow. Uh, and by definition, the bank stations are generally defining the channel. So having encroachments inside of the bank stations um, is generally frowned upon because you are encroaching inside the channel itself uh, if you are 
kind of following the other general guidelines and definitions of you know where your bank stations are placed. Uh, it's also worth noting the surcharge limits that we talked about earlier, knowing your local floodplain uh, ordinances. You know, in Colorado, uh, older floodways that were mapped under a one foot criteria stay under the one foot criteria, uh, but new floodways being established or those uh, established in newer studies using a half foot criteria uh, all have to use the half a foot. Uh, it's also important to note the negative surcharges. Um, FEMA will not recognize negative surcharges that result. And that is generally speaking, uh, what will show up on a floodway data table. And so we are looking at what rounds to a negative 0.1 um, or, or greater negative value. So negative 0 0.04 generally rounds to 0, 0.0, and that would be the limit of what we would accept as a part of a revision. Uh, the other things to note, you know, if vertical tie-in are not achieved, um, having that half a foot to the effective data and then your 0.1 foot to the pre-project uh, is a tie-in that is expected as a part of the review. Uh, some of the- Henry, I'm sorry, can I jump in for just one second? Um, sure. If you have your hand raised, if you can go into the chat box, then we can help um, address your, your question. Thank you. All right, thanks, James. And I guess I'll just mention to anybody if I have, uh, <laughs> haven't called on you or answered your question, I'm sorry, uh, working the presentation and keeping up with the chat box is, is not the uh, easiest thing in the world, but we will do our best to, <laughs> to address any questions or concerns as well uh, if we have a few minutes here at the end, which we are, we are nearing. So um, some of the other items here, so our mapping, uh, as I mentioned before, our 5% of, of firm panel scale is the general tolerance and agreement that we would look for between map and model. Um, areas shown in the model uh, as inundated, but that are not mapped on the actual you know, final mapping product are things that would pop up as a red flag or potential levy situations. Um, insufficient topography. Um, you know, I, I love this work figure because it gives me an example of, a, of what a headache it can cause to, to receive an, an illegible map. Um, you know, having sufficient labels on your topography, uh, vertical datum, topography that's not extensive enough to actually show how you are containing the floodplains that you are delineating, uh, things of that nature make it very hard for a reviewer, um, you know, to actually confirm and feel comfortable, um, you know, without requesting some additional clarification of what's going on. Uh, other missing key items uh, from mapping, such as your cross sections, your effective flood zones, uh, the certification vertical datum, and the digital mapping files. These are all things that I talked over earlier in the basic requirements. Um, missing any of those items could require that we have to clarify them or ask for additional data. And again, that could hold back the revision um, and cause delays. So finally, uh, just the basic recommendations for a timely review. How can you save yourself time um, and save everybody some effort in this process because it can be a long process. That MT2 instructions document, uh, as well as the new MT2 guidance document are good, great resources um, that you should look at. You know, again, providing explanations for anything unique or any inputs that are going into your analysis and modeling. Um, the more you give us, the more you explain up front, the less we have to ask uh, if we can't figure it out as we're going through. Um, all backup and supporting data, you know, the digital executable models. Uh, and finally, conducting the internal agreement checks, you know, using that 5% of firm scale as an internal check before you submit it to us, um, because we will be checking those things. We will be checking the, re the reach lengths along the channel between cross sections um, between your map and model. We will be checking the top widths, um, you know, the overall conformance of the data that you've given us between the model, the as-built plans or the proposed plans, and then the actual final mapping product. Ensuring agreement between those is just one less item that will show up on an additional data request and, you know, one less potential holdup in your review. And so with that, uh, that is actually the end of my presentation here. I believe we have a few minutes uh, that we could 
maybe do some some Q&A, James, if you have any input. And I will just remind anybody um, at this point for, for CEC credits, we'll also ask you just to drop your name uh, and information in the box if you are if you are hoping for CEC credits for this as well. Um, so with that, I will field some questions. Great, Henry. Thank you so much for that. Um, great job explaining all of this. Uh, there, there was one question that I see in the Q&A. Um, is there a required contour in our interval for topo work maps? Sure. And so yes and no. Um, <laughs> the general rule of thumb, again, is that the data must be as good or better than what was used for the effective analysis. Um, if you, I will say there is a, a preference, you know, that if you have two foot contours available, that that is, uh, you know, is great to provide. Ultimately, we are looking at best available. So as long as it is as good or better than the effective analysis, um, you know, that is kind of the, the minimum requirement we are looking at. And one more quick note. Um, so there is at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. And then there is also a chat box. If you could put your information into the chat box, not the Q&A, that will be helpful for our uh, for us to be able to to collect all those at the end of this, please. And of course, you know, I'm happy to stick around for for a few more minutes to see if any other questions do do show up in that Q&A. Um, of course, while people are typing their names in, we'll give it a few minutes so that people can go back and forth. Uh, but I do want to afford people the opportunity to uh, to ask their questions if they have them. Um, you know, I, I can say firsthand that you know, working in the MT2 world, it, it will be very hard to believe if anybody ever said that they know everything. Um, so I know there are questions out there. Uh, I know there's a, a good chance that I've potentially cause some confusion or, uh, or stir some questions up in your mind. So please feel free to, uh, you know, to, to get those answered now, or, you know, we're always happy for some follow-up afterwards if necessary. And then I guess at this time, uh, James, maybe, you know, better is kind of the administrator on here. I don't know if we have any of other, uh, our other panelists participants that, uh, would like to include any additional information or uh, <laughs> anything that they don't want me leading people uh, astray with with my general PTS knowledge versus the local knowledge of uh, CWCB or Mile High Flood District. Um, sure. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll first go to Brooke and Stacy uh, to see if they have any kind of final comments. Um, or or anything that they want to leave the group with and then we'll pass it off to FEMA for the same question and then we can go from there. Thanks, James. This is Brooke. I don't have anything to add from um, my life flood district. Great, thank you. Um, and I do see that some of you have your hands raised. Uh, if you could please type into the chat box if you have a question um, or a comment that you would like addressed, that 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 would be probably the best way for us to be able to address your your hand being raised. Um, and again, if you can throw your put your your name and email address into the uh, into the chat box, so we can make sure that we get the CE credits under your name. Um, and I do see a question here yeah. that's that's come in. Um, so a local HOA has failed to maintain a pond, which is significantly filled with sedimentation. What can the FPA, re what can FPA required of the HOA to maintain or prepare a LOMAR? Um, so I will say, you know, that is probably something that, you know, might need some additional clarification. If that pond was used to attenuate the base flood flows. Uh, so to reduce the flows coming out of the pond as shown on the regulatory products, uh, there should be an official operation and maintenance plan uh, generally um, accepted and approved through the community. And you know that type of language would include that. Um, if the pond is not being used to attenuate flow and is not actually reducing it based on flood storage, um, then I would say, you know, generally the O&M is not something that's included there. So ultimately it will come down to, you know, what impact is that actually having? Is it reducing flood flow, um, you know, or is it just 
kind of an obstacle in the way of a steady flow analysis and not really having any impact on the overall discharges making it downstream. Great. Well, right now I'll pass it off to Chris Gaines and to see if she or, or FEMA has any kind of last words uh, today. And, and, and then I think the panelists can stick around for a few more moments uh, just to make sure that there are no lingering questions. Uh, thanks, James. I don't have anything, but I would like to thank Henry for a very comprehensive um, training. It was really good and I always learn something new. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, I'll remind you one more time to please provide us your name and email address in the chat box so that we can get you these CE credits. And, and then I think with that, we can let you go seven minutes early. Um, and, 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 and again, if the panelists can stick around for just a few more moments, uh, just to make sure that there are no additional questions.